In general, there's only two ways to do a repair job, the right way and the wrong way. The wrong way to do a repair job is to attack it without any kind of a plan. Simply taking off old parts and putting on new ones will fix the problem eventually, but that wastes a lot of time and effort. It also gets expensive. The right way to do the job is to have a logical troubleshooting procedure to follow. The troubleshooting procedure is sort of like a battle plan, a strategy, that will lead you to the problem with the least amount of effort and mistakes along the way. In this program, we're going to show you a general troubleshooting procedure that has seven steps. We're also going to show you how to apply this troubleshooting procedure to a specific system, the cranking system on four-cycle gasoline engines. We'll start with the general troubleshooting procedure. Remember, you can follow this procedure to diagnose any repair problem. The first step is to know the system that is giving you the problem. Take the time to look the system up in the technical manual and refresh your memory. Second step, discuss the problem with the operator of the machine. Find out how the machine was being used and what kind of symptoms the operator experienced. Third step, inspect the machine. Walk around and take a good look at it. Look for things like oil leaks or loose parts. Don't clean the machine until you've had a chance to inspect it, because you might wash away some clues to the problem. Fourth step, try running the machine yourself. See if you have the same problems the operator described. By now, you should have a good idea of what the symptoms are. You can draw up a list of possible causes, which is step five. Sit down and think about the system a little, and then list the problems that could cause the symptoms you've discovered. Make a list of those problems, in some cases just mental notes will do, starting with the most probable ones and the easiest ones to check. For example, if the engine doesn't crank when you turn the starter switch, the first problem you'd probably list is a bad battery. Step six, plan your attack on the problem. Think about what you're going to test first, second, and so on. The diagnostic section of your technical manual can often help you here. Step seven, Start your repair work following the strategy you've laid out in the previous step. Check off the possible problems one by one until you've got all the symptoms corrected. Now that you've seen the general troubleshooting procedure, let's apply it to a particular system. The cranking system on a 200 series tractor, for example. We'll start right off with the first step. Know the system. This is a diagram of the cranking system. It's like the one you'd find in your technical manual. Notice that the cranking system consists of the battery, solenoid, circuit breaker, ammeter, key switch, transmission neutral start switch, PTO safety start switch, starting motor, and all the wiring that connects them. Let's look at how the system works. Current for starting the tractor flows from the battery through the circuit breaker and ammeter to the ignition switch. The circuit breaker protects the electrical system from overloading, and the ammeter checks the charge condition of the battery. When you turn the ignition switch to the start position, current from the battery passes through the transmission neutral start switch and the PTO safety switch. Both the transmission and the PTO have to be in neutral before the engine will start. When the current flows to the solenoid, it connects the battery to the starter. The starter turns, engaging the flywheel and starting the system. Now, after refreshing your knowledge of the cranking system, you should talk to the operator to find out just what the problem is, which is step two. With cranking systems, the most common complaint is that the starting motor doesn't turn when the ignition switch is turned to the start position. Try to get all the information you can from the operator. For example, ask if the tractor had been used recently or if it had been sitting for quite a while. Take a look at the machine before you go any further. Look for things like broken wires or loose connections. Go on to step four of your general troubleshooting procedure. Try starting the tractor yourself and take note of any symptoms. For example, perhaps when you turn the key, you hear the solenoid click, but nothing else happens. Think about the symptoms and draw up a list of possible causes, which is step five. A discharged battery is an obvious possible cause. The problem could also be the starter motor or the starter motor drive. 
There might be a problem in the wiring. The engine might even be seized. But that will be quite evident because you won't be able to turn it over by hand. In steps six and seven of the general troubleshooting procedure, you work out a plan of attack and then execute it. In the rest of this program, we'll show you our version of a good troubleshooting plan to diagnose problems in a cranking system. The first thing to check is the battery. Use a voltmeter to see if the battery's voltage falls between 11.5 to 12.6 volts. If not, the battery should be charged before you try anything else. Check the battery terminals and the connection at the starter terminal to see if they are tight. Don't forget the ground connections either. Remember, the other half of the circuit is the ground. If the battery's okay, try bypassing the wiring to see if the starter motor works. Run a jumper cable from the positive battery post to the terminal on the starter motor. For safety's sake, remove the spark plug, put the transmission in neutral, and disengage the PTO before connecting the jumper cable. On some tractors, you may have to remove the battery to perform this test. If the engine cranks, the problem is in the wiring and switches between the battery and the starter motor. If the starter engages but does not crank the engine, the problem could be in several areas. The starter drive could be defective, the battery could be run down, or the engine itself might be seized. If the starter motor doesn't engage or turn, the problem is probably in the starter motor itself. By doing those two simple tests, checking the battery voltage and running a jumper cable to the starter, you've narrowed your problem down to one of three areas. The problem is either in the battery, the starter motor, drive or engine, or it's in the wiring and switches between the battery and the starter motor. The simplest place to start is with the battery. These are the three checks you should do on the battery. A visual check, a hydrometer test, and a load test. To do these tests, you'll need a hydrometer and a load tester. Do the visual check first. Look the battery over, first checking for things like a cracked or broken case or damage to the terminals. Dirt on the battery might be allowing it to self-discharge. Check the electrolyte level and add water if necessary, preferably distilled water. Never add electrolyte to the battery. If you do add water to the battery, be sure to recharge the battery before performing any further tests. Then perform a hydrometer test to check the specific gravity of the electrolyte. You can find directions for performing a hydrometer test in Fundamentals of Service Electrical Systems. Remember that temperature affects specific gravity. If the specific gravity varies by more than 50 points from cell to cell, the battery is defective. The last check you should perform on the battery is a load test. There are a wide variety of load testers available and you should follow the battery manufacturer's recommendations as to which one you should use. Follow the instructions that come with the load tester and use the specifications on the battery case or in the technical manual. With battery recharged or replaced, try to start the engine again. If it still won't start, go on to the starter motor. Remove the starter and visually check it. Then, test its armature. To do these tests, you'll need an armature growler tester and a continuity light. Start by checking the armature's physical condition. Check to see if it turns freely. If the armature shaft is bent, the shaft will either be hard to turn or it will feel sloppy. Inspect both bushings and end caps for wear and dirt. Replace them if necessary. Look to see if there are any grooves or wear on the commutator. You may have to turn and true the commutator and undercut the mica. Compare the starter motor brushes with new ones to see if the old ones are worn or refer to the technical manual for wear specifications. Replace the old ones when necessary. When checking the armature windings, you'll be looking for open circuits, grounds, and shorts. To test for open circuits, you'll need to use a growler. You should use the instructions that come with the growler to do this test. An open circuit is usually caused by running the starter for too long at one time. That causes burning or arcing on the commutator bars. If you see signs of burning, sometimes you can repair the commutator by resoldering the leads to the riser bars of the commutator. Look for grounds with a continuity light. 
place one lead on the iron core and the other lead on each of the commutator bars. If the light ever goes on, that means there's a ground and you'll have to replace the armature. You'll need to use the growler to look for short circuits too. Sometimes a short will develop when a piece of metal bridges the gap between one commutator bar and another. To repair this type of short, you'll need to undercut the mica and try to test again. Some starter motors have field windings too. If so, you should check the field windings for open circuits, grounds, and shorts. However, most starter motors used with small gasoline engines have permanent magnet fields. Check to see if these magnets are loose or cracked. That takes care of the starter motor, but before putting it back on the tractor, you should check the starter drive for any malfunctioning parts. So far, we've covered battery and starter motor repair. If both are functioning properly, only the wiring circuit is left. Here's that wiring diagram again. Rather than testing the whole starting circuit at once, the best thing to do is divide it up into sub-circuits and then test each sub-circuit individually. The first sub-circuit is between the battery and the ignition switch. In this sub-circuit, current passes from the battery to a terminal on the solenoid, to the circuit breaker, ammeter, and onto the ignition switch. The second sub-circuit starts at the ignition switch and goes to the solenoid. This is the control circuit, because when the ignition switch closes, current actuates the solenoid and lets current flow from the battery to the starter motor. There are two other switches in the control circuit, the transmission neutral safety switch and the PTO neutral safety switch. Both must be closed for the engine to start. The transmission neutral switch senses when the shift lever is in neutral, preventing the operator from starting the tractor while it's in gear. The PTO neutral start safety switch senses when the PTO is in the disengaged position, preventing the operator from starting the tractor when the PTO is engaged. The type of neutral start safety switch used depends on whether the tractor has an electric PTO switch or a mechanical PTO lever. Refer to the technical manual for details. The third sub-circuit goes from the solenoid to the starting motor. When the first two sub-circuits are complete, Current flows from the battery through the solenoid and into the starter motor, starting the engine. We know from the previous test that the battery and starter motor are okay. Here's the sequence of tests you should use to test the wiring sub-circuits. First, turn the ignition key to the start position. If you hear a click, that means the solenoid is engaging. If the solenoid engages but the motor still doesn't turn over, that means the first two sub-circuits are okay but something is wrong with the third one, the wiring from the solenoid to the starter. If you don't hear a click, something is wrong with one of the first two sub-circuits. You can find out which sub-circuit is defective by checking voltage at the solenoid. Check voltage at this terminal of the solenoid, the one that is connected to the battery. If there's no voltage there, either the positive battery terminal is loose or corroded, or the connection is loose. The connection of the solenoid may be loose, or there might be a problem with the wire. If there's voltage at the first terminal, remove the lead wire from this terminal and connect the voltmeter probe to the lead wire, the one that's connected to the ignition switch and the neutral safety switches. Turn the ignition switch to the start position. If you do get a voltage reading with the ignition switch in the start position, that means there is current available to the solenoid. Something must be wrong with the solenoid. If you don't get a voltage reading at the solenoid, something's wrong in one of the two sub-circuits that feed current to the solenoid. Start with the circuit that feeds current to the ignition switch. Check for voltage at the battery terminal of the ignition switch. Check the technical manual to make sure which terminal goes to the battery. If you don't get any voltage there, that means there's a loose connection, broken wire, or ground in the circuit between the battery and the ignition switch. If there is voltage at the battery terminal of the ignition switch, check the switch itself. Follow instructions in the technical manual to do this. If the ignition switch is okay, the only thing that's left is the control circuit. Use the voltmeter to check for voltage on either side of the neutral start switches. Some neutral start switches are adjustable, so if you find one that isn't closing properly, see if you can adjust it before trying to replace it. 
the procedure we've just shown you should take care of any problem you might have with the cranking system on 200 series tractors. You can use the same procedure on other cranking systems too, but remember that they might have different components. Use the appropriate technical manual whenever you try to diagnose an electrical system problem. Also, remember to use the seven-step general troubleshooting procedure in every repair situation. Those seven steps are, one, know the system you're working on. Two, talk with the operator about the problem. Three, take a close look at the machine. Four, try the machine yourself. Five, make a list of possible causes. Six, make a plan for finding the problem. And finally, step seven, carry out that plan, looking for the problem in a thorough, methodical way. Using a logical troubleshooting procedure will enable you to diagnose problems more quickly and accurately. And you should be able to take care of the problem the first time you tackle it.